Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is I want to look at a classic physics problem involving a person riding an amusement park ride. And where I grew up, that amusement park ride was called the Gravitron. It was a UFO looking uh, device where you got inside, you leaned up against the wall, it starts spinning really, really fast and eventually either the floor drops or the wall can kind of move up and down. And then you're kind of just staying stuck to the wall as you start spinning. So we're gonna look at this and look at the physics behind it. We'll start with the free body diagram and I wanna look at three basic questions. One, what is the minimum speed that you have to spin before you kind of get rid of the floor and the person sticks there to the wall? Uh, another way to ask the same question is to find what is the minimum RPM required? Right? How many revolutions per minute before you can lower that floor? Uh, another question I can ask you is, well, once you're spinning like that, what is the G-force acting on a person who's riding this ride? Okay, so let's have a look at it. Again, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. All right, let's get started. All right, so in order to solve this problem, we're gonna assume a couple things. Uh, first of all, the ride is going to be a cylinder, a big giant cylinder, make that as simple as possible. And the other thing is that the radius of the cylinder, I'll call it uppercase R, and we're gonna label that as say four meters. Okay, kind of a big ride, can fit a lot of people. Uh, what else? I'm also gonna tell you that the uh, material that they use over there has a coefficient of static friction, Okay, remember we don't want things to move. So this would be a static friction case. We don't want any sliding or slipping. Uh, that coefficient, we're gonna also call that 0 0.4 and that doesn't have any units. Okay, so again, the first question is, how do you find the minimum speed? Okay, uh, before solving this problem, it's good just to draw a free body diagram of this system. Okay, so I've already done that for you. Here's kind of a, a person here who's uh, riding this ride and the ride is currently spinning right now. Uh, there are basically three forces acting on this person. Okay, there's going to be the force of gravity, right? That is the weight of the object and that is acting straight down. The weight is always the mass of the person times little g and in everything that follows, little g is going to be the acceleration due to gravity. We call that 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. All right, that's one force that we're gonna have. Now we're also going to have static friction because we got this object here that wants to get pulled down by gravity, but we want friction to oppose that motion. And the reason that it's going to be static friction, uh, again, we don't want any slipping. If there's no slipping, it's a static situation. Okay, uh, friction tends to oppose the motion. So if that motion would be down, well, friction would be acting up in this case. And it's usually along the surface, right? The surface is the surface of the wall and the surface, the back surface of the person. All right, so I've got the force of static friction here acting straight up. Now we'll come back to the magnitude in just a minute, right? We just wanna get the direction of the forces now. Now the other really, really important force which I have on this free body diagram right here is the normal force. Okay, that is the wall of the Gravitron or of the amusement park ride that is pushing the person. Now remember, this person is going around in a circle with a constant radius. That radius is four meters, okay? For him to stay in that circle, there has to be a force acting toward the center of the circle. And in this case, it's the contact force between the person and the wall. The wall is pushing on the person to keep them going in that circle. We'll look at the top view in the next slide. Okay, these are the three forces acting on the person and that is it, there are no other forces. All right, let's go to the next slide and do a little bit more algebra. All right, so in order to solve this problem, again, starting with our free body diagram, I wanna show you the top-down view of the same, uh, same person over here. From the top-down view, you have the normal force, which is acting toward the center of the circle. Now, you still have the weight and the friction, but those ones are gonna be in and out of the page if you're looking at it from the top-down view. Uh, so the weight would be going into the page. I would write it like this, and then my force of static friction would be out of the page. I would write it as something like this. But I just wanna show you the normal force here is always going to be toward the center of the circle, right? Depending on where the object is, when the person is down here at the bottom, the normal force is toward the center of the circle. So this is a centripetal acceleration problem. If the normal force is acting toward the center of the circle, guess what? Our acceleration, which I'm gonna just 
illustrate with this squiggly line here, our acceleration is always toward the center of the circle, right? So here it is, there's the acceleration. Likewise here, the acceleration is going to be straight up, okay? And the magnitude of this centripetal acceleration, this one you should know, is V squared over R. Okay, so this is really going to be an important equation right here. All right, we now want to look at the equilibrium condition here. In the vertical direction, we want these forces to balance out, okay? We want the force of static friction to equal to the weight. In that case, there won't be an acceleration up and down. Now, the force of static friction can carry a range of values, right? Force of static friction is often written like this. It's less than or equal to a coefficient of friction multiplied by a normal force. Or another way of writing the same equation is that this is an inequality, but if you wanted to write it as an equation, you can really only write an equation for the maximum value. And the maximum value is actually equal to this value. It could be less, but this is the maximum value. So this is two ways of writing the same thing. Kind of like this way, because at least I have an equal sign here. All right, so how are we gonna have equilibrium? Well, as long as the static friction is the maximum force is bigger than the weight, you're gonna be okay, because the static friction could be less than that. Right, so the equilibrium condition is really as long as this guy is bigger or equal to the weight, we're going to be okay. Again, this is the maximum force of static friction. As long as that there is bigger than the weight, we're not going to slide down. Okay, so this will be our equation one. This is basically looking at the forces in the vertical direction. All right, what about the forces now in the direction that's pointing toward the center of the circle? Again, there's only one force pointing toward the center of the circle. Therefore, there has to be a net force, and this is the net force. Therefore, there has to be an acceleration. That acceleration is this very specific value. It's the centripetal acceleration because we have motion in a circle. So again, you can write the normal force as V squared over R. All right, these are my two equations. I'm going to combine them and use the information in order to find what this minimum speed is. To solve what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take my normal force expression and I'm gonna substitute it right up here. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So we get the coefficient of static friction. Instead of writing normal force, I'm gonna substitute normal force by m v squared over r. And as long as this term here is bigger or equal to the weight of the object, we're good. Now, the nice thing you see about this expression over here is I have the mass on both sides, which is good. That means I could cancel out or divide through by the mass. And this is going to be useful because it means that whether you're a kid or an adult, uh, you're going to notice that the mass is not going to appear in our final result, which is good. So it'll be safe for everybody. <laughs> All right, so let's isolate now for V squared. So I have to bring radius on the other side. I have to bring coefficient of friction on the other side. So again, doing a bit of algebra. Nothing too complicated here. We have little g multiplied by the radius and divided by this coefficient of static friction. All right, at the end, if I want to get v by itself, as long as v is bigger or equal to the square root of gr over mu s. Okay, so now you can see that there is a minimum value of the speed, right? I mean, if v is, uh, you know, 100 kilometers per hour, you're fine, right? You're going to stick to that wall. But, you know, you don't want to, the ride to spin too fast either. You just want it to be safe so that people just stick to the wall, right? So our minimum value of the speed here is really when, let me just write minimum, it's when it's going to be equal to that value, right? So it's root of gr over mu s. All right, we were given everything about this problem. The radius is four. Uh, at the beginning, I said the coefficient of static friction was 0 0.4, and little g we know, therefore we can get a number for this minimum speed. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so this will be a 9.8. What else? We had four meters over here, and we had 0 0.4 for my coefficient of static friction. Uh, at the end, you substitute in all the values here. Hopefully I did that correctly. Uh, my minimum speed for rotation here will be 9.9 .9, uh, meters per second. Okay, as long as the speed is at least this, you're going to be okay to ride this. You can take the floor away and the person's going to stick to the wall. All right, if you wanted to look a little bit more at the kinematics here of what's going on, again, if you think about this, this is just an object that's going around in a circle, right? And we found what this minimum speed is, 
right? So you can really write it as something like this. Uh, the speed is simply the total distance, uh, which is the circumference, 2 pi r, over the period, right? How long does it take to do one turn? And if you're looking at the minimum speed, which is what we have over here, um, this would correspond to a maximum period, right? If you make the period big, you make the speed smaller, right? That's why you have this kind of relationship. Uh, if you just want to keep it algebraically for now, I guess in principle you could substitute in all the numbers right here because you know minimum speed, uh, we know the radius, so that's it, right? I like to do a little bit of algebra personally, but that's just me. So T max would be 2 pi r over V min, right? And you can get everything into a nice compact equation if you do something like this, 2 pi r, again, divided by V min. V min now is going to be this. Oh, how are we going to write this? So we're going to write this as square root of a gr over the square root of mu s, right? That gets kind of flipped around, and I just broke it down just to make it look better. Uh, what you can do now is just combine everything inside one square root term. If I bring the 2 pi r inside, this would be 2 pi r, but it would be kind of squared, <laughs> right? Mu s would be here, and everything else would be here also. Now you notice you have r's in the top and the bottom. You can finally just simplify that and have one final expression. If I expand that squared, I get 4 pi squared. You're going to have one r in the numerator, uh, mu s, and last thing divided by a little g. All right, now I kind of like to substitute the values in here. Uh, 4 pi squared multiplied by 4 multiplied by 0 0.4 and divided by 9.8. Okay, so our, oops, let's try that again. Divided by 9.8. So our maximum period that we find, uh, if I did that correctly, I think I get around 2.5, uh, maybe 5.3 or 5.4 seconds, close enough. Okay. So if our period is uh, at least uh, this value over here, it could be smaller than that, then it just means it's rotating faster, right? 2.54 seconds will give us a speed uh, equal to 9.9 .9 for this particular ride, and everyone's going to be safe. All right, let's now look at the RPMs, right? If I look at the ride, kind of 9.9 .9 doesn't tell me a lot, but how many RPMs, what is the rotation per minute count of the Gravitron? And then we want to look at the G-force acting on this guy. All right, to find the RPM, remember what RPM means. It simply means how many revolutions you have per minute, right? So a revolution per minute. We have right now the amount of time it takes to do one, right, one revolution. So if you think about it, I'm going to write this down as uh, we have one revolution in how much time? Well, in 2.54 seconds, right? So we're not quite at the right units. We have revolutions here in the numerator, but here we have seconds here in the denominator. So all we need to do now is just kind of do a conversion here just to get the right units. We want to have minutes at the end, and actually we have seconds right now, so we need to cancel this out. And I know in one minute we have 60 seconds. All right, so really all you have to do is take 60 and divide it by 2.54. So that means our RPM, the revolutions per minute, gives us a number that's around 24, okay? And if you look at the videos for rides of the Gravitron, they are around 24 RPMs, okay? So that's kind of how you would calculate that. Okay, let's look at the G-force now acting on that person who's spinning at 24 RPMs. All right, in order for me to calculate the G-force, G-force is really just the kind of a fancy word for finding the force. What is the force acting on the guy? Well, it's really just the normal force, right? Uh, but when they say G-force, sometimes they just want to know the normal force, say, over the weight or over the mass of the guy. But let's just write it like this for now, and then we'll figure out what this ratio is, right? If the normal force would be equal to 1, we would call that 1G, okay? If this ratio equals to 2, we would call that 2G, right? That would be the G-force acting on the guy. Well, our normal force, if you remember our expression, it was simply mass times acceleration, except acceleration took this very specific value, okay? Now, if I divide this by mg, this is what I get, okay? I can cancel this out, I can cancel this out. Now, remember our expression for the speed, right? We did a whole bunch of work in order to find what the speed was. 
and uh, the speed was square root of g over uh, g multiplied by r over mu s, but speed squared then uh, would simply be gr over mu s. All right, now I still have gr that's coming in from the definition over here. Actually, so you can see a lot of things are canceling out right here, okay? And my expression here for the normal force divided by the weight by this ratio is 1 over mu s. Okay, mu s was 0 0.4, um, so it's like 1 over 0 0.4. <laughs> so this ratio right here is going to be equal to approximately, well, oh, I think that gives me like 2.5, right? So we have that the normal force equals... 2.5 times the weight of the person, right? And this is basically kind of what the g-force is, right? So we'd say that the g-force is 2.5 times the weight of the person, right? That is the g-force, or 2.5 g's, people would often say, right? 2.5 g's would be kind of the g-force. All right, so we'd get 2.5 g for this specific speed. Now, I could spin faster. If I spin faster, I'm going to get a bigger g force because this term could be anything, right? It just depends on how fast I want to spin the ride. If I take this value, that was my minimum. So this will be the minimum g force acting on a person will be 2.5 g's. All right, anyway, thanks for watching, folks. Hopefully, you learned something about amusement park rides.